Well, good morning, and take your Bibles and leave it there, open to Revelation 21. In a Christian understanding, the biblical understanding, uh, Jesus really has one coming. He has one coming that is divided into two parts. Uh, There is one day of the Lord. It's a day which began when Jesus came in his incarnation. It's a day which will be completed when he comes again. One coming, one day, two parts. And what we're doing is we're looking in a little mini-series at what will happen when, when he completes his coming. What will happen when he comes in that second part? And that's what, we're, that's what Revelation 21 and 22 are all about. Let me pray for us as we look at this text. Lord, we need to hear the truth. Your word is truth. So that we might be set free. Lord Jesus, you are the word, you are the truth. So we ask that you would come and set us free. And that we might be free indeed. Amen. Well, it was the end of high school, and my mom decided that she wanted to make a scrapbook for all the years of my life up until that point. Many people do this, right, the senior year scrapbook. And so uh, it was for months there was this room that had pictures out all over it. Well, not really months, years. I didn't get that scrapbook until I finished college because she was working on it intently for four years. She just started it and couldn't finish it. Uh, But one day I was going into that room and I wandered in and I saw one of these pictures and it was a picture of me and several friends who I was graduating with and it was a picture of us from fourth grade. And as I looked at that picture and saw us and it was a swim party and we were all swimming and that kind of thing, I looked at our faces and I looked at our statures and all that and I thought, oh, isn't it interesting the ways in which we've stayed the same and the ways in which we've changed? And it got me thinking, thinking back, got me thinking forward, and I thought, what will we look like in 10 years at our 10-year reunion? What will we look like in 20 years at our 20-year reunion? Uh, Who will be bald and who will be gray? Um, Who who will have bellies and who will have bellies? We will all have bellies. Uh, And I I thought, what will time do? What lines will time draw on our faces? You've probably experienced that. Looking back causes you to look forward. I think about that with my daughter. What will she look like at 25? Will her cheeks be round and plump? Or will they be square and chiseled? How tall will she be? Will she be taller than me? A legitimate question for me to ask. These are are questions that that we think about, and perhaps you've thought about this. Perhaps you've thought about it with yourself. What will I look like as the years go on? Well, here in in this text, we find out something about what we'll look like. The Bible says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That is, we will not all die, but we will all be changed. That when Jesus comes again, we will all be changed. That God will change us, but what what will we look like? What will he change us into? Well, the picture is right here in the text that was read for us earlier. In verses 9 and 10, John, the apostle, is carried away by an angel up to a high mountain. And the angel says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. But then it's a little confusing because verse 10, it goes on to say, and he showed me all the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Now, what's happening here? Did the angel get confused? I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb, and he shows him a city. We expect to see a bride, and yet we see a city. What is going on here? Well, in John's imaginative world, the bride is the city, is the bride. You see, the city is both a place and a people. 
But we saw this at the very beginning, back in Revelation 21, verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You see, the city is the bride. And so, as we look at this city, we get to see a picture of what we will be like when Jesus returns. What God will change us into. And what happens then? What will happen when God's people, to God's people, when he appears? Will we like it? And that's one question that we ask as we look at ourselves in the future, right? Are we going to like what we see? See, the the, whatever picture you have of yourself in the future, it's going to inform whether you want to go that way or not. And here John tells us that we've got something to look forward to. The first thing we find out is that when Jesus appears, God will beautify his people. Look at verses 19 and 20. It says that that this city, it starts to describe the city, and the city that it describes is absolutely beautiful. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was of pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, so on and so forth. The foundations of this city are going to be decked out with the most precious stones. Uh, You may or may not know this. Most of you, I'm sure, uh, probably don't and don't care. But if you find a really high-quality men's suit, one of the things about really high-quality men's suits is that on the inside of the suit jacket, right, uh, there will usually be an elaborate design, sometimes a funky design, particularly if it's from an English suit maker. And, and, the, and the insides are made so well and fashioned so well. And, and, but the thing about that is, is nobody gets to see it. But, but here's the deal. If, if the insides are made that well, then you know that what's on the outside is made really well, Right? <laughs> Okay, some of you don't get that illustration. That's okay. Don't ask me how I know. I, I don't have these suits, but I have, I have, you know, longed and lusted and, you know, these kinds of things. But what about this? How about this? When we go into a restaurant, uh, my wife, she's got a background in nutrition, and because of that, food safety is very important to her. So when we go in a restaurant, she checks out how clean the bathrooms are. And here's why. Because if the bathroom is clean, if the bathroom is really, really, really clean, then you know that the kitchen is really, really, really clean. If they take that much care with the bathroom, then how much care are they going to take with the kitchen, you see? And here we have a city whose foundations, who sees the foundations of a house? Nobody. But the foundations are decked with the most beautiful materials. Well, if that's the case, then how much beautiful must the rest of the city be? Now, there are some beautiful churches out there. York Minster, Durham Cathedral, Cologne Cathedral, St. Paul's in London, uh, uh, Christ Church, Oxford, King's College, Cambridge. Beautiful, beautiful. But, you know, most, most churches don't look like that. Most churches that are vibrant, that people attend, are really unremarkable if you drive by them. And, and that's the buildings. What about the people? Even, even those beautiful churches, if you go in, the people usually look pretty unremarkable. I mean, it's not like you would take all their pictures and put them on People magazine. This is not the kind of people that we see around us often in church. I mean, we're just a bunch of regular folks. And on the surface, there isn't necessarily a lot of beauty there. There is beauty, but it's concealed, it's hidden. And John says, no, that day they will shine. And in the church, it's not just that it's, it's, not just that its appearance is um, unremarkable. Uh, let's be honest, um, the church isn't all that morally beautiful either once you get into her and get involved. I was talking to someone the other day and asked them if they had been at church lately and where they were attending, and and they went off for probably five minutes complaining about how awful people in church are and how 
uh, how uh, grossly immoral Christians in Santa Barbara are. And, and as I listened to this person, I thought, I can't really disagree. As I look at my own life, as I look at other people's, I'm not what I should be. We're not what we should be. And I, I thought about that. And yet, and yet John says, we will be beautiful. Brilliantly beautiful. Uh, That we will turn heads. And where does this beauty come from? Look in verse 11. It says that they have, the city has the glory of God. It's radiance like the most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. Now, when it says that it's like Jasper, that's significant because earlier in the book of Revelation, Revelation 4, 3, we learn that God's appearance is like Jasper. In other words, when, when John describes this as being radiant like Jasper, clear as crystal, what he's saying is that, that the church will radiate with the very beauty of God. That's how she will be. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 says this, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We will reflect his own glory. And this affects how we conduct ourselves, how we view ourselves, how we conduct ourselves. Because John goes on to say that everyone who hopes thus, everyone who has this hope in himself, purifies himself just as he is pure. See, are you being what you are going to be becoming? Are you being what you are becoming? Are you living into what you will be? Are you acting out the beauty of, That God is going to turn you into. That is what this call is for. It changes how we conduct ourselves. It also changes how we conduct ourselves in relation to others. C.S. Lewis in his little essay, The Weight of Glory, said this. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now... You would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, that is, these overwhelming destinies, it is with awe and circumspection. I'm sorry, it is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. Do you, do you hear what Lewis is saying? Lewis is saying that, that if you saw a person today, a Christian today, in their glorified state, you would be tempted to worship them because of what God is turning them into. See, this should absolutely transform the way in which we view one another. And how we conduct ourselves with one another. You see, we love one another not based on what we look like now. Oh, no. But based on what we know God is going to turn us into. And we continue to keep that vision of the other person in our mind and on our horizon and all our dealings with them. We say, I see what God is going to make you into. And therefore, I am going to deal with you such and help you along in that direction. But if this is true for us as individuals, it's also true for the community as a whole. When um, I was in high school, there was a, a, a gal who really went up through elementary school with, with me. And we'll call her Samantha. Samantha was about two years behind everyone else because she was so precocious. Uh, and two years in high school or middle school is quite a bit of a, a developmental gap. 
And because of that, I mean, Samantha was always a little bit nerdy, and she never socially fit in very well, and she didn't carry herself very well. And when um, dances came around or homecoming or whatever, she was never really invited. And I can just imagine it as one of those moms or something was picking us all up from practice and we were talking about who we were going to take to the prom or to homecoming or to whatever. And, uh, and someone's like, I don't know who I'm going to take. And I, I could just see as, you know, we driving by Samantha, that mom thinking, well, why don't you ask Samantha? But of course, if a mom would have suggested that, we would all laugh and be like, Samantha, no, she's, she's kind of nerdy. She's weird. Well, no. And I could just see that mom thinking to herself, you better pay her more attention or you're going to regret it. Well, sure enough, we did regret it because the end of college is coming along and now we're not thinking about homecoming, we're thinking about spouses. And Samantha, well, she had come into her own and was doing very well for herself. And we all, uh, at that point, wanted to pay her more attention, but she would have none of it. Smart girl. You know, the church is the bride of Christ. And she will be beautiful. And if you don't start paying her more attention, you're going to regret it. If you don't start investing in her, you're going to regret it. If you better stop ignoring her, you're going to regret it. You better pay her a little more attention or you're going to regret it. You better stop finding excuses not to identify with her or one day you might find that she won't identify with you in all her glory. See, this, this is the church, warts and all. But God is turning her into something beautiful. Beautiful. And she's worth investing in. So first, when Jesus appears, God will beautify his people. Uh, second, when Jesus appears, God will unify his people. If you have a Bible, this wasn't read, but look back up in verses 2 and 3. In 2 and 3, John sees this one bride. But then in verse 3, it says in the English something like this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and God will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. But that doesn't quite capture what the text says in the original language. It actually says that, God will, be, um, will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be their God. In other words, this one bride is going to be many peoples. Now, that doesn't make for good English, but it makes for great theology. Because here's the point. On that day, God will unify his people into one bride, but without eradicating diversity. You know, we are a people today, we are a country today, we are a world today who is divided against itself. We are politically divided, we can barely keep our government going. Uh, we are racially divided. Uh, just read the headlines and think about the aftermath of Ferguson and New York. Think about the reactions. We are a people who are racially divided. And this isn't simply a localized problem. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and the racial tensions there were very, very high. Uh, in 2002, 2003, I lived in Austria, and the government shut down because of ethnic tensions. When I was in St. Louis, well, you know that there are ethnic and racial tensions there. I had two friends on separate occasions who lived in Boston tell me, about one Caucasian, one Asian, tell me about how bad the racial tensions are there. You see, this is not a localized problem. Uh, nor is it a modern problem. Uh, in the New Testament, we see page after page after page of ink being spilt on this racial tension between Jews and Gentiles. Just think about it. Acts chapters 9 and 10, 15... Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 14, Galatians chapters 2 and 3, Ephesians chapter 2, all about racial tensions between Jews and Gentiles that are going on in the first century world. You see, this is not 
a modern problem. This is a ubiquitous problem. And it goes back to when Adam and Eve first took the fruit. And they ate. And then they could not handle difference. Difference looked like a threat. Difference was looked on with suspicion. And so the man blames the woman. It was the woman, this other person, the different person who you gave me. And then what happens with their children, Cain and Abel? Well, they couldn't handle difference either. The difference between gifting and vocations caused jealousy and death. You see, this is a human problem because ever since the fall, we do not know what to do with our difference and we can't live one, with one another in it. And so while difference is not a problem, it's not a problem for God, it is a problem for us because it is the very place where our sin latches on and takes root and acts out in the world. And one day, someday, one day, someday, when Jesus returns, God is going to eradicate our division but without eradicating the difference. All the nations bring their glories into Jerusalem. And the nations represent the world in all its diversity. See, difference is not a problem for God, but it is for us. You see, one day, racial divisions and the gender divisions that we have and the nationality divisions that we have and the upbringings, these very places where sin takes root and comes to life in our lives, Romans, uh, Revelation 21 says that God will eradicate all this. Theologian who works at Duke named Stanley Hauerwas says this, that church is constituted as a new people who have been gathered from the nations to remind the world that we are in fact one people. Gathering, therefore, is an eschatological act as it is a foretaste of the unity of the communion of the saints. Hauerwas is saying that, that when we gather together in all our difference and all our diversity, and we with one voice praise God, and we do that actually in ways that represent our difference and our diversity, then what we do is we say to the world, this is what God's doing. He's going to unify all people, and he's going to do it without eradicating difference. Different styles of music. Different styles of prayer, different styles of dress, different languages. These things, though, they will remain. But God will unify all people, all the distinctions in his son. Because God will be all in all. So first, we see that, that when Jesus appears, God will beautify his people. Second, we've seen that when Jesus appears, God will um, beautify his people. Second, we've seen that when Jesus appears, God will unify his people. But third, when Jesus appears, God will fortify his people. In verse 12, this city is described as having a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. Now, we don't really have a lot of gated cities anymore, but ancient cities were built with walls and gates. Perhaps you've been to some of them. York, Toledo, Avila, even Jerusalem. These are walled cities, and why did they have walls and gates? Well, for protection. They protect those within the city. And so when this, talks about this, uh, when this text talks about um, gates and Thick walls, I mean, hugely thick walls, and, and angels there, warrior-like beings there. It's saying that, that this place will be a place that is protected, protected and preserved. Uh, in verses 15 and 16, we're told that this is an interesting thing, that, that John is to take, or the angel takes this measuring rod to measure the city. Now, what's that about? Why do we get all these verses about measuring the city? Well, measuring in the Bible often has to do with preservation. Uh, for instance, look in Revelation chapter uh, 11, verses 1 and 2. Uh, there, John is told to rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. And then it says this, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, 
For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. John is told, uh, measure the whole temple. It said, don't measure this area. Don't measure the outer court. Why? Because it won't be preserved. See, everything that's measured is preserved, but the bit which isn't measured, that's not going to be preserved. So when the angel in chapter 21 gets the measuring rod out and measures the entire city, what he's saying is this entire city will be protected and preserved. In other words, there will be no chance of a second fall. No threat of sin or death or Satan or any of the things that threaten our lives today. That's why the sea is no more. The sea is that place from which the enemies came. The enemies from the west came in the Mediterranean. That is what the sea represents. And there will be no sea because there will be no threat. And who? Who will God protect and preserve? Well, notice that in verse 12 it says that on these gates there are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then in verse 14, it says that on the foundations of the city were the names of the 12 apostles. Now, the 12 tribes of Israel, that represents all of God's people from before the revelation of Christ. And these are the gates of the city because that is the gates through which the the kingdom was established. That's how the entrance happened. And then on the foundations, you have the 12 apostles representing all of God's people after the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, what he's saying that who's going to be included in the city, who's going to be protected and preserved, all of God's people from all time, from before the revelation of Christ to after the revelation of Christ, not one is going to be lost, not one is going to be missing. God will preserve and protect each one. I was once heard a story about little Chad Thompson. He was in elementary school, and his least favorite day of the year was Valentine's Day. Because Valentine's Day was the day when you made all the Valentines and handed them out to your friends. It was harmless. He also had to decorate a box, a box, uh, it was supposedly harmless, a box, a shoe box that you would put in front of your cubby. And there, all day, that shoe box would wait to receive Valentine's. And he hated that day because he never got a lot of Valentines. And so one year, he came up to his mom and his mom, Ruth Ann, and he said, Mom, uh, next year, I'm going to make Valentines for every person in class. And his mom was like, oh, no. He thinks that this is going to get him more Valentines. Oh, no. She was just prepping for the disappointment and the the hours of counseling that she would have to do uh, with Chad or pay for afterwards. Uh, I'm still going to counseling for this. (laughs) But he he, he poured himself, his blood, sweat, and tears into these Valentines, and he made them, and he went off to school, and he came back at the end of the day that day. And and his mom, Ruth Ann, she went out to the bus stop, And she saw all the little kids running off the bus, and they all had their Valentines in their hands. And Chad came off, and he didn't have any. And her heart sank, and she thought, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. And then he looked at her, and he said, not a one, Mom, not a one. And then he smiled, and he said, I didn't miss a one. I gave them all away. I gave them all away. Mission accomplished. I got every one in the box. Every one. I gave them all away. I didn't lose one. You know, Jesus, he says in John 6 that he has come down from heaven not to do his own will, but to do the will of him who sent him. And this is the will of the one who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus says, I will lose nothing of those you have given me, but I will raise them up on the last day. It's as if you could picture Jesus on that day coming down and meeting his bride. 
and looking back up at his father and saying, not a one, dad, not a one. I didn't miss a one. Not one was lost. Not one was let go. Mission accomplished. I got them all. Every one that you gave me, I got them all. See, God won't lose you. He will protect you and preserve you forever. Not a one. A, this is a, a picture of, of God beautifying his people, of God unifying his people, of God fortifying his people for eternity. And finally, when Jesus appears, we see that God will satisfy his people. Three times in this text, we read about the water of life. At chapter 21, verse 6, it says, To the thirsty I will give him from the spring of the water of life without payment. Chapter 22, verse 1, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Uh, Chapter 22, verse 17, And let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who desires take of the water of life without price. Now, we're all thirsty for this water. We just don't call it thirst. We call it dissatisfaction. And it looks like this. It's the dissatisfaction that searches, that uh, sends us searching for the perfect car, or the perfect house, or the perfect companion, or the perfect job. It's the, it's the reason that we are so restless, restless on vacation, it's why we move from often one career to the next, one major to the next, one, uh, one partner to another. And it's that reason that we have that sickening suspicion that when we get what we're after, it still won't satisfy. See, we're all thirsty. We're all thirsty. One of the most played songs over the last uh, two years has been that song, Happy, by Pharrell Williams, who, I don't know if you know this, he is the opposite of Will Ferrell. I don't know how that works, but you can have cousins and opposites. Pharrell Williams, I should run these by people, (laughs) shouldn't I? Yes. Anyway, it's the song Happy, uh, it's titled Happy. I think it, it was mistitled. It should be titled Annoying, but that's just me. And as it's uh, being played, everybody sings and dances, and everybody wants to be happy. And it's tapped into something. That is this desire, this obsession we have as a culture to be happy. We are all in the pursuit of happiness, but we don't want the pursuit of happiness. We want happiness. We want to achieve, we want to arrive, and more than that, we want to be satisfied. To be satisfied. Uh, We want to be completely contented. And a few of the times in my life where I've sat down and haven't thought about the next thing that I need to do, haven't been anxious or restless about the next thing to accomplish or what I can go get, to make my situation better, few of the times when I've just been able to sit contented. And there are beautiful times. And we're all after those times. But when we have them, they still dissipate. See, we want something more. We want something that lasts forever. Well, this water of life, this is God coming to satisfy his people forever. And how is he going to satisfy him? I mean, what is this water of life? What is this living water? Well, in John 7, Jesus goes to a feast. And when he's at the feast, he stands up and he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then John comments, Now this he said about the Spirit. What is the living water? It is the Spirit. It's God himself pouring himself into you. 
and now we taste it and we are satisfied to a certain degree, but we taste it, it's like we have a water fountain. And you go to a water fountain and you drink and it quenches your thirst, but, but, but you have to go to the water fountain and it's only coming out in drips and drabs and not completely. But, but that day, oh, what will it be like when we are able to drink from the fountainhead, to dive into it, to swim in it? That's what he is describing. When God will enter you and fill you with himself and he will be all in all. You see, beneath every other thirst that we have is a thirst for God. And and as our bodies need water, so we need God to live. Have you got that yet? That the thing that you're most thirsty for is God? That the thing that you need and desire and the only thing will satisfy you more than anything else is this? To see him as he is, to be like him, to drink from all that he is? Well, when you do, here's what starts to happen. Here's how you can tell. You stop chasing every other little thing to be satisfied. And you you start to feel this kind of ache in your heart. For his return. I have a friend that signs every one of his emails. Heaven soon. See that that is a man. Who knows where satisfaction ultimately comes from. And he is longing for it. See what happens is. When you start to realize this. You start to have this ache within your heart. For Jesus' return. and, And that ache gives rise to a prayer. It's a short prayer. It's a simple prayer. It's a prayer that you say over and over and over again. Come, Lord Jesus. 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 Amen.